so um, just very quickly i'll give a brief to this uh, session and then we can move on essentially what this session hopes to do is uh, explore the continuum that the rural urban is in reality as against its uh, uh, binary structuration that is very popular within plan and policy uh, we would like to look at um, the city the, uh, we would like to explore how the resilience of the city can be uh, can be enhanced uh, via interventions at various scales these can be at the larger scale that is the city region scale which really cuts across these binaries of the rural and the urban or it can be the sub city scale but essentially what we are saying is that even as the climate change induced vulnerabilities are getting exacerbated the solutions are more are are clearly cutting across these binaries of the urban and the rural so basically what we want to do is explore the potential of positioning the city region irrespective of the urban and the rural and its attendant restoration as the ca uh, canvas for systemic adaptation at all scales and why we have put out this uh, type uh, session is because essentially uh there are scales where the rural urban becomes a limiting factor to looking at adaptation to climate change induced uh, vulnerabilities but maybe there are scales at which it makes a lot more sense so we are trying to keep this session and this conversation open and in that context we would like to uh, explore the city region as the canvas for systemic adaptation to climate change induced vulnerabilities uh so that's the essential background to this particular session uh i think we can move on to uh um, uh discuss it, uh, move on for the rest of the sessions but before that i would request my team my colleague gayatri to give a few uh, uh housekeeping rules as well as the agenda thanks anji uh, welcome everyone to today's session uh so we'll start off with a, i'll just run you through the agenda uh, we'll start off with a short video uh, which talks about uh, climate change impacts from the ground which would be then followed by uh, five thematic presentations which will uh, last for roughly around 15 minutes and then we will uh, have a short break of around 5 minutes we can get back from the break and then uh, uh, discuss regarding uh, the presentations that happened for the break and also the emerging provocations and questions uh, that arise from these discussions and then if uh, 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 as we move forward we we'll see if we can uh, you know go ahead and this uh, take forward the discussions into different breakout rooms uh, based on the uh, emerging provocations and then finally we will close the sessions by uh, collating some of the messages for cop 27 uh, on this thematic session um so uh, yeah so the first uh, presentation will be by uh, uh, dr vasavi who is a social anthropologist who works on agrarian studies and uh, sociology of india and education studies she is uh, currently with punarchip which is a collective that works on alternative learning programs for the rural youth so uh, before she starts discussing i'll just uh, uh, play the video that i mentioned earlier on uh, uh, voices on climate change from the ground yeah uh Thank you, Anjali, and the team at InDesign for organizing this meeting. Uh, basically, I was going to contextualize what uh, our friends would have uh, described in the video, which is their kind of experiences of climate change and also their understandings of what climate change is uh, in this uh, part of uh, southern India. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I would uh, start by contextualizing. Uh, what they have represented uh, as the experiences of changing rainfall uh, decreasing natural resources uh, decreasing productivity on the land a uh, lack of uh, you know the changing biodiversity and what monoculture agriculture is doing to their uh, to their diets to the food cultures etc and to the overall sense of the abuse of the uh, rural landscape that many of them are experiencing in a very uh, deep and in a very troubled manner Uh, to to frame that exp those experiences, uh, I look at both the macro political economy in the way in which the rural and the urban are structured, 
but also the socio-cultural trends, especially in the rural areas that account for an inability to deal with uh, climate change, to come up with strategies of resilience. Uh, so this kind, this political economy, basically, um, uh, even to go before that, uh, how is uh, climate change manifested in this region uh, where we have uh, filmed uh, these uh, four or five people speaking, uh, is that uh, when we've looked at data for since uh, 1901 for rainfall and temperature, it shows that the actual average amount, total amount of rainfall has not changed so much. Uh, this is a kind of a semi-arid area. The average was about 700 to 750 millimeters. That is more or less the same on, on, the, on the years when there is rainfall. But what has shifted very dramatically is the monsoon, the pattern of the monsoons itself. Uh, the amount of rainfall when it comes and how much comes at which period. And basically, the data shows that the southwest monsoons starting from June have actually decreased, whereas the northeast monsoons have increased. But more specifically, between the two main cultivation seasons, uh, there is a lack of coordination. Uh, so the earlier cultivation patterns no longer match the existing monsoon cycle. So there's a lot of confusion among farmers as to when to sow, when to, uh, or, you know, it sometimes rains during harvest season, etc. So this kind of mismatch is also what has led to a lot of trouble, to a lot of crop loss, and therefore also food uh, loss. But at, uh, looking at temperature levels, this area, uh, which is in, uh, in the rainfall shadow, is indicating has higher than average uh, rainfall uh, temperature increases, higher than the average for India. The average for India is 0.01%, but for this region, it is 0.02%. This is linked to two issues, which is an expansion over the past two decades of uh, you know uh, virgin lands, especially forest land, into commercial chemical agriculture, therefore increasing not only carbon dioxide emissions, but also very significant loss of green cover. Uh, so that also accounts for the fact that although the forest department denies it, green cover across the rural areas have decreased a lot based on a link to increasing concretization of villages, you know, building houses, but road expansion of roads and overall concretization of all uh, living habitats itself. So with that, uh, other key natural resources that are manifesting in this global warming is the loss and uh, very significant and very extant degradation of water bodies, lakes, tanks, uh, streams, etc., along with very severe depletion of groundwater, uh, where All India mapping shows that some of these areas are critical in, in, in terms of uh, the average depth of groundwater is uh, about uh, uh, a thousand feet. In, in this area. So this uh, basically, uh, these are some of the features of not only resource depletion, but the ways in which uh, global warming is especially increasing temperatures, uh, dust cover and uh, shifting rainfall patterns are affecting the region. So to understand this, what and why there is uh, no uh, action of, um, over the past five years, we've uh, documented the area to see whether either village residents take action. First of all, what is their understanding of global warming and climate change? But also, what is the actions that elected representatives would take or administrators, the bureaucracy, or the larger government systems itself would take? What we see is overall, there is not so much of denialism. There, everybody says, yes, there is global warming and climate change. But what should be done? How should what kind what forms of resilience should be built in? What kind of strat strategies need to adapt to be adapted? Are issues that are not only not spoken about, but the very intense um, extraction of natural resources and the abuse of natural resources uh, continues to be uh, ongoing. And in fact, what we are seeing in many of the distress that is manifesting not only in the increase in the number of dr droughts, the periodicity of droughts in the area, for example, for the past, in the past 18 years, 12 years have been drought years, the lack of access to water, especially drinking water, and the decreasing productivity of the old lands itself uh, are issues that need to be addressed or the increasing number of diseases, very, uh, very frequent uh, outbreaks of fevers and uh, illnesses in the area, especially among children, are, are issues that are not at risk. So what accounts for this is I would draw on what uh, in design uh, the introduction hinted at, which was 
to look go beyond uh, just the region itself to say that overall uh, rural india um, and especially its nexus to the urban is based on the fact that there is an adverse integration of the rural into the urban adverse in terms of how the primarily the dominant political economy now increasingly a globalizing economy appropriates local resources natural resources but also labor and even profit and capital into its circuits and very little of it is returned back into the rural areas as a result of which what we are seeing is the onset and the establishment of extractive economies in the rural areas extractive similar to how it is in mining where you actually extract out the resources without it being sustainable or being returned but even in the context of agriculture it is no longer sustainable earlier multi crop sustainable you know low productive agriculture or even drought resilient agriculture but high productive agriculture primarily led by the use of tube wells and a whole load of external inputs which include chemical fertilizers pesticides and very heavy machinery as a result of which two heavy artifacts technological artifacts have become key in this landscape one is the pitchfork which is used to flatten lands and to extend out into the forest areas and the tube well which has become ubiquitous across the cultivation belt so much so that agriculture itself now is being defined as wet agriculture and unlike what it was earlier which was dry agriculture along with this what you see what it uh, is is attendant with this is a very deep fragmentation of rural communities uh, where the uh, structures have been destabilized so significantly that the earlier kind of if not um, collective in the sense of earlier even if, if it was hierarchical and caste based there was some kind of collective responsibilities towards natural resources uh, in the caretaking of the commons of the, of uh, grazing grounds the lakes the streams and the forests etc all those have been uh, eroded as a result of which what you see is an intense uh, way in which uh, competitive exploitation is taking place without the regulatory mechanisms put into place now uh, have this is also buttressed by the fact that a large numbers of elites especially the elected representatives now live in the towns and in the cities even if their income is being generated from the rural areas and for a large numbers of the laboring poor for whom cannot who don't don't make uh, adequate living in the rural areas it is seasonal and uh, circular migration to the urban areas especially especially to the metropolitan areas that accounts for the lack of for the lack of engagement and for the overall absence in these rural areas so it is this kind of unusual and what we call adverse integration into the rural economy that accounts for the uh, lack of uh, attention uh, or the overall neglect of uh, natural resources management in the rural areas the other two factors are uh, a uh, spread and an internalization of the developmental model development model which is primarily about you know high growth uh, led by technology and uh, ca capital etc uh, which is endorsed not only by elected representatives elites or the administrators but overall also accepted by the people themselves uh, has a way in which not only out of poverty but has a way out uh, out of the existing uh, kinds of uh, the living the life worlds itself uh this accounts for the extent to which uh, there is a huge promotion through media through uh, financial schemes uh through subsidies etc for not only chemical agriculture but also for say con concrete based construction for all kinds of enterprises which really uh, don't take care of the ecology uh of course there is also the spread of what are called the economies of desire promoted it again not only by the new kinds of mass media social media etc but also higher levels of consumerism which have been made uh, possible by by the little kind of extra capital that has entered the rural areas so this i think largely accounts for the fact that the average citizen is really not in a position um, to engage with issues of climate change or to develop forms of strategies for resilience either for the short term or for the long term at this having said this i don't see the average citizen again has just uh, you know an in individualized uh, profit seeking uh, citizen but may, a large number of actually just eking out a living trying to just get out of some of the traps 
that they have been uh, caught into. So it's in this context that conservation of natural resources, um, strategies of sustainability, or about what we would call use of appropriate technologies, etc., are all thrown by the side. And it's in this context that climate change, especially associated with changing monsoons or increasing temperatures, are seen as something that is happening far away, that is a result of some larger uh, structural natural forces or even uh, you know extra natural forces or even being divinely ordained, but not really a manifestation of anthropogenic, that is human-made factors, in which it is the local and the region itself that is also responsible uh, for uh, uh, some of these trends. For example, very good data shows that chemical agriculture accounts for a la large percentage of carbon dioxide emissions. At the same time, there is no even, there is not only non-recognition of this by administrators, but the agro-business industry continues to promote uh, chemicalization, not only fertilizers, but pesticides, but all, all, for example, the new kinds of uh, materials that are being dumped are herbicides, uh, glyphosate, etc., all of which are very uh, dangerous and uh, also uh, have uh, negative uh, implications for human health. So in failing to address these uh, issues, what I see uh, broadly is that it accounts for the fact that much of a countryside, rural country, countryside, now is ma marked by this kind of malign neglect, neglect of natural resources, but also neglect of human agencies to strategize, to come up with ways in which they could not only scaffold the resources, but also make viable, sustainable livelihoods. So it's... I think the challenge then is for all of us to take climate change and its manifestations, especially manifestations that are locally specific uh, and which can be uh, rendered in locally understandable and relatable terms, to come up with strategies uh, to promote not only decentralized resilience, but what I would say has democratized, decentralized, convivial conservation of resources in which the responsibilities have to rest with local people, with local citizens. So it is here that in that context that the ideals of, it's not just, you know, there is always a rhetoric of being, you know, since a concern, uh, climate change is seen primarily as an ecological concern. It has to be seen as a concern for not only climate justice, therefore for social justice, inequities, structurally embedded inequities have to be addressed. Economic equity and stability also has to be seen. And then ecological stability is something that should be fostered. So overall, uh, what is called a convivial forms of conservation needs to be engaged with, along with restructuring uh, society for much more stability and overall well-being of citizens. With that, I'll close my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vasili. And apologies, everyone, for the uh, technical glitch earlier uh, in playing the video. Uh, we'll try to play the video again. The audio is still not working. Yeah. I think we can skip this. Uh, we'll just try it again towards the end of the presentations. And... So, Anusri, uh, might be your audio system is not, uh, not working properly. Can you retry these things again? In yeah, pop-up sure. screen, when you uh, when you share a video, just when you are in a pop-up screen, just select the share sound from audio uh, computer and optimize the video. Both both are selected. Make sure before you share in screen. 
yeah, we, we will try that towards the end of the presentations. Uh, right now, we'll just move forward. Um, next, we have a, a presentation by uh, Dr. Anna Taylor. She is uh, a geographer who specializes in urban climate adaptation, and she focuses mainly on African cities. Uh, she engages in research on climate resilience, sustainable urbanism, and public decision making and multi level governance as well. Uh, currently, she is a research fellow with the African Climate and Development Initiative. Uh, uh, Anna, over to you. Thanks very much. I'm just going to try and share my screen quickly so I can show a few slides, if that's okay. Can you see that okay? Yes, yes we it's can. perfect. Yes, but make it full view, please. Yeah. Is it there? So I'm done. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, colleagues, for inviting me to join this very interesting session. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some work that we're doing around groundwater usage in, sit in South African cities. Really just to um, expand a bit on the theme of the, the session, which is the city regional scale and what comes into view when you look at um, how South African cities are rapidly, increasingly turning to groundwater usage as an additional urban supply, because one of the main climate variability and climate change related risks that we are already facing is drought. And that overlays onto complex urban dynamics um, that mean that our um, infrastructure investments and maintenance ha has not been, has not kept up with our urbanization rates. And if anything, that's getting more severe. And also that we have a history of very high water consumption in our urban areas. So it's really forcing us to, to rethink how we um, use and relate to water in our cities. So we're focusing on two cities in South Africa, Cape Town and Nelson Mandela Bay municipality, which is actually in itself kind of a city region. This, the main city within that is called Kebeja. It used to be called Port Elizabeth. But both of these cities have or are currently in the throes of severe water crises in the sense that the city government, the residents and the businesses of the city are facing the real potential of, of running out of water completely um, within these cities. We know this isn't completely unique to our area. Other cities around the world are facing these similar threats and so we're really thinking about what does this what does this highlight about um, what's not working in the ways that we are managing and governing water in our context so just to highlight this point about the city region so this is a, a map showing the in green there you see the um the, the municipal, the metropolitan municipality, which actually includes a city and a number of surrounding towns. But this map highlights how the key water sources that are servicing those towns and cities are being drawn from well beyond the boundaries of that city. So already we can see that the functional city region, just from a water perspective, extends well beyond the, the jurisdiction of the city government. And if I show you the next map, in fact, the, the, the city that we're talking about, which is right on the coast within the smaller yellow circle, is actually currently, while going through a water crisis, relying on half of its water sources coming from the Orange River, which is the river circled by the large yellow circle, which is in the north of the country and is shared, in fact, with two of our international neighbors, neighboring countries. And so it really highlights when we talk about the functional city region from a water perspective, how big the scale is potentially that that takes us to um, when thinking about how cities need to adapt in the face of, of climate change. 
And as one can imagine that the, the usage of water through an interbasin transfer from that large river that's servicing three different countries, an enormous industrial and agricultural set of sectors along the full stretch of that river. Um, so the city is competing with a lot of other users and its transfer is high up in the system. So downstream users are very much affected by the extent to which our cities are relying on these, these um, transfer schemes. And so in the work that we're doing, we using this idea of urban metabolism, which is kind of growing as a paradigm internationally. And we are finding, we're kind of testing how its utility in the South African context as a metaphor and an analytical device for understanding better, as this picture depicts, the flows into our cities, within our cities, and then out of our cities. So from a water perspective, from a water metabolism perspective at the urban scale, it really highlights how a number of flows, of natural flows and anthropogenic flows through dams, pipelines, bring a large volume of water into our the, the sort of spatial extent of our cities that is consumed at a very high rate, not very well reused. So the smaller arrows show the potential for reuse, but currently our cities are very poor at maximizing the, the possible reuses of that water. And then it's simply moving out of our urban system as wastewater and often pretty dirty wastewater back into our rivers and ultimately into our oceans. So the current configuration of our urban metabolisms in our cities, and which we try to highlight through our analyses, is very inefficient, inequitable, and ultimately kind of drawing far more resources than it should from neighboring rural areas. But our, our futures are very closely connected because these cities are growing in their demand. And at the moment, they're causing um, considerable um, wastage and pollution of downstream water that's having severe knock-on effects. So we're really trying to look at the different ways in which we can understand those flows. So this shows, again, a different visualization of the volumes of water. This is for the case of Cape Town that is coming in as runoff, as rainfall, as groundwater. So some of the natural flows within our city boundaries. But then the, the, the brown lines show the anthropogenic um, sources of water where we harvesting into dams, bringing in through pipelines into the city regions. And then what happens? What are the interactions between those flows? And that, that image of the, the dials is the reason for doing this kind of analysis is trying to identify where are the dials that, um, that can be turned in different positive or negative directions. And where does the influence for turning that dial lie? So who are the actors that have their hands on the dial, so to speak? Whether those are changing through climate change, the natural flows of water into our cities, but also through, through engineering and green infrastructure interventions, the flows um, between those different sources. So that's the nature of our research, re research is to try and quantify those flows to really get a good sense of not only the biophysical, but also the infrastructural systems that, that connect our systems to pretty vast hinterlands where there is growing conflict over water use. But what we're trying to promote is look at who has their hands on those dials and how can that those situations be reconfigured to ones of competition, to ones of solidarity and care and sharing of a commons resource. And so that's really the governance piece of our research is trying to understand not only on paper who has authority and responsibility for shaping those flows, whether as a user or as a regulator or as an enforcer, but who in real terms has the capacity for, to fulfill those functions. And that's where often, you know, the private sector plays a much bigger role than on paper government should be playing or 
citizens are taking much more into their own hands because the public supply is not servicing them. So the need for self-supply is growing in many cases. So it's a pretty crowded landscape. But what we're learning from the international literature and India very much features strongly in that is that we cannot carry on with this mentality that a state-centered groundwater governance set of arrangements that's designed around command and control approaches to regulating and enforcing the regulation of groundwater, that we, do, we simply don't have the government capacity that can enforce that over a distributed system. And we have to be shifting, as we heard from the previous speaker, to much more of a bottom-up based approaches on on urban communities working together with rural communities in um, networks of solidarity and care to rehabilitate and conserve these critical sources that we are sharing and increasingly reliant on. So we've seen huge urbanization, but that urbanization cannot rely on the over-exploitation of our aquifers. We have to shift to um, we have to actively change the, the relationship between our urban societies and rural societies and the water resources that we rely on to be more sustainable. And that really is about fostering these collective actions of care and solidarity organized around not in the regulating individual pumping behaviors or the operations of individual wells, but rather looking at how we form networks that care for the health of aquifers that sustain our um, economies and, and our households in these areas. And so we're really taking a very participatory approach of trying to make explicit to people, make these invisible processes more visible, both about how groundwater works physically and about who has their hand on these dials that are making our cities more or less sustainable when it comes to groundwater um, and surface water use and the conjunctive use of those different sources. And so we, we're really working through a series of exercises that highlight how city governments play a role, but they can't play that role without national government, without working more collaboratively with neighboring municipalities that are rural municipalities. And that the private sector currently has their hand on a lot of those dials, even though on paper it's the public sector. And so we have to really shift the way that the private sector works away from only favoring their kind of clients to acting as intermediaries that encourage compliance with shared rules and norms rather than circumventing um, rules that require more enforcement capacity that we simply don't have within our government systems. Um, because we know from these exercises that we are hugely undercapacitated from enforcement functions, and there's just no ways we can grow those functions to the requirements to regulate the system. So we have to support these more bottom-up um, Compli a compliance culture rather than a command and control enforcement approach. Um, and there's an important role for the media in that. There's an important role for urban water users to be mobilized and organized politically to take a stake in the decisions that are affecting those water sources and to reconfigure the, the, the role that the private sector plays um, rather than enabling over abstraction to really be held to account in the role that they play for, for caring for those resources. And so the, the provocation I wish to put into this um, session is, you know, we have many examples from South Africa, but, but globally, including many from India, from Mexico, from Morocco, from other places around the world about rural forums that are being established to, to build these solidarity networks to take an active role in protecting groundwater sources. But as yet, we don't have a good conception or practice of what that could look like in an urban or a city regional perspective. What will it take to mobilize urban water users in similar ways, but in these much more dense, um, contested, 
and and often very polluting urban spaces um you know what will it look like to scale those governance models to an urban setting and what role do our local elected representatives and politicians have to play in doing that at the moment they are often more of an obstruction than a support because party politics is so fractious in this country but can we can we re-empower and reimagine the role that local elected representatives can play in these kinds of networks so sorry if that's gone a little bit over time but i hope that's a useful contribution thank you so much thank you thank you so much anna for that uh, wonderful presentation uh, next we have uh, Dr. Sabira. He uh, has been primarily working on land use and land cover change studies and exploring their consequences on uh, sustainability and understanding their relationships with resources and transportation. He uh, also focuses on the evolution and growth of cities and towns and in understanding the planning practices and studying the effects of uh, governance on the same. Currently, he's the director of Gubi Labs. And uh, Subira, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, uh, to Anjali Mohan and Integrated Design for hosting this uh, really interesting uh, set of conversation. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, I guess. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, I really like uh, the provocation by uh, Anna, uh, but I would I would want to take a step back and uh, sort of uh, uh, ask uh, some more uh, pertinent questions on how do we situate the urban in the like in the larger context of looking at urban and regional aspects and also the uh, periphery and the villages at large. Uh, so if you, if you kind of try to relook at what is urban, uh, we have at uh, current in India, we kind of uh, look at definitions that have been largely driven by census of India, and also of the definition that has been in practice through the Karnataka Municipalities Act, that is largely determining the status of uh, urban local bodies, whether it is a town panchayat or a town municipal council, city municipal council, or a city corporation. Now, uh, in, in all of this context, uh, uh, it's mostly for the urban local body as to how uh, uh, or what, what con constitutes an urban, which also is interestingly a function of, uh, you know, one density, of course, but also a function of how much of uh, main working population employed in non-agricultural activities. I guess that's something that uh, may also have to be re-looked at and uh, perhaps for a larger debate. But on the other hand, while we are looking at urban as such uh, through the lens of a local body and so on, and saying like uh, if you're trying to uh, look at as the them as you know like autonomous in the sense of rural and urban, we also see a sort of an uh, emerging uh, fuzzy nature of governance, uh, largely uh, emerged through what we call as entrepreneurial bureaucracy. Uh, that doesn't sort of strictly define seem to define or uh, stay within the formal definitions of the urban. For instance, uh, in Bangalore, uh, for a host of uh, services, right? Uh, like bus, public bus transport, like BMTC, or uh, power distribution through BESCOM, or water supply and sewerage uh, services by BWSSP, they don't seem to simply uh, match with what is urban, either as defined by census or as defined by the municipality side. For instance, uh, they don't seem to simply comply with what the jurisdiction of uh, Greater Bangalore City Corporation is, but they seem to operate in their own ways. Now, uh, that's a very interesting case here. So in the sense, how do you now uh, uh, look at uh, trying to bring different things together and then ask uh, questions on that? I will uh, perhaps dive in a bit on this entrepreneurial, uh, sort of what I call as uh, bureaucratic entrepreneurship, because that's something uh, is, I think, is a cause of concern, um, uh, particularly the way it is emerging in Karnataka. 
And largely what has happened is we have a host of public services that has now been corporatized by the state. Uh, basically, they are government of Karnataka enterprises uh, from like Bangalore Metropolitan Transport Corporation to uh, Bescom and host of things like that. So uh, this seems to be a, like a loose adoption of what was new public management that was in vogue in 80s and 90s. And there was also like, I guess there are a lot of theorists who also uh, uh, grounded it in like and uh, brought out a lot of things against uh, why this has this why one shouldn't continue this. But uh, yet India, I think uh, Karnataka sort of uh, went ahead and adapted comfortably in a way that it has sort of created uh, over 100 plus companies uh, that are responsible for a host of uh, different services, uh, be it agriculture, water supply, wastewater management, urban infrastructure, roads, canals, irrigation, power, you name it, you have a company in Karnataka for that run by the government of Karnataka. Now, uh, strictly under new public management, one of the things was being accountable and also being uh, and like ensuring uh, uh, greater participation or in terms of you know uh, uh, having other place also to participate. But what we seem to now have is uh, uh, one, the, there is lack of accountability because it is the bureaucrats uh, that seem to be running this. Two, uh, uh, there is also sort of a monopoly because they are the only company running such services. For instance, if you look at BMPC, it is a monopoly or Bescom, which is also a monopoly when it comes to uh, power. Now, uh, having said this, I guess uh, what has also happened is urban is also not spared or like at a regional level also nothing is spared. And we seem to be running into a situation where we have uh, bureaucrats running it with lack of uh, public participation on the one hand, and also the stake of the elected representative also is becoming marginalized. Now, in this larger context, right, as in the way things are emerging, now how do we situate climate change? As in, who who is actually going to, you know, uh, like where do we build the cat types? Right? As in, who is going to be listening, and how do we now drive things there? Like that's that's uh, a key concern here. As in, like how do we or where can we situate climate change in this larger context? So, in, in fact, in one of the uh, Earlier studies, when we looked at uh, so, you know, so separate aspects like uh, on you know uh, clean energy and things like that, uh, for energy alone in Bangalore, there are different agencies that are concerned. Apart from Biscom, you have Karnataka Power Corporation Limited, another government of Karnataka Enterprises, and a host of other agencies like Karnataka Power Transmission Company and Corporation Limited and things like that. And then we also have a larger state body called Karnataka Electricity Regulatory Commission. Now the key question is who is planning for energy in Bangalore? As in who is going to decide whether there is going to be clean fuel or what sources of fuel is going to be used for energy in Bangalore? Now a question that came back was who is planning? As in uh, it seemed that nobody seemed to be uh, in charge of it. Bescom simply said uh, we have some uh, projected demands, we are working with it, and we get power from KPTCL, and that's about it. KPTCL says we buy from KPCL. KPCL says that there are different sources that we buy it from there. But at like if you look at one lakh feet above, right? As in the question is, uh, uh, who is actually taking key decisions? Now, in all of this one, like I give, just give you an example of what is happening with respect to energy. I'm afraid it is a similar situation when it comes to other critical resources like water or be it land use planning or even mobility as in how should we really reimagine how, uh, the oral scheme of things of how you know we look at urban and regional planning in, in that context now it seems that in all of this we have the like the entities created by the bureaucracy that is driving a lot of it but with with almost clearly lack of any political thought leadership or anything like that that is emerging and also, it seems to be techno managerially driven, all of it in, that, in, in some senses. But what we really clearly are, are, are sort of seeing is that uh, there is absolutely no public participation in that sense. There's also context to that, in the sense, I think uh, it's time uh, in, the, in these larger contexts, we also have to relook at how uh, urban and uh, 
regional planning is uh, you know in practice today unfortunately uh, the way we are practicing planning which is only land use planning is through the act that is that was enacted in 1961 although we have several amendments that have been made to the act at best they have been regressive like for example uh, we have the classic case of akrama sakrama that has been there made to kind of say okay we will have one time uh, exemption for all the violations that have been done as per the plan that is one two uh, the master plan like section 9 on section 12 of the town and country planning act specifically says what should be the contents and the desired outputs of the master plan that is something that we may have to really rule out it because it it's kind of it stipulates mostly on land use plan it doesn't really uh, look at larger scheme of things on like the other questions that we asked as to who is looking at energy water or mobility housing a host of issues right education and health there are a host of things that we may have to also really look at and given the context of you know climate change and how do you now also integrate climate action plans into all of this seems to be at the moment far fetched in the sense in the current scheme of things and perhaps that's where I, i kind of argue that i think we will need a new law to actually start with that but the other challenge for us is also to see how do we now uh, imagine a situation where we also kind of enable participatory planning i like anas thing that you know we need to make see how we how do we actually make it political in the sense uh, how do you get elected representatives talk on this because at the moment it is only the bureaucracy who is doing something unfortunately also as in but in the sense but we also don't really have a political buying yet so how do we the key challenges in in if, if we have to drive a lot of things related to uh, climate change and, and and you know enabling or embedding climate action plans into the larger scheme of things through participatory planning and all of it uh, i guess uh, we will have to really really look at it how do you make it political and uh, drive it down uh, at at that level i'll just leave it at this and if there are any uh, questions and i will be happy to take it up thank you thank you so much uh, maybe take the questions uh, after the short break we'll take it together uh, meanwhile uh, please feel free to post your questions in the chat box uh, next we have uh, dr mariana vidal marino who works on climate change adaptation sustainable development and natural resource management in the global south uh, she focuses on the application of bottom up mixed method approaches to identify and co generate solutions to complex problems like climate change uh she is a member of plan adapts coordination hub and uh is an analyst at the technical evaluation reference group of the adaptation fund uh mariana yes thank you let me um try to share my screen and my presentation um yep now it looks good thanks so much uh good day everyone i'm quite happy to be able to contribute to today's session um as you already heard from my uh colleagues today the overall objective of this session is really to explore how decentralized ways of thinking and acting can lead to action in enhancing resilience in city regions So my entry point to contribute to this topic is via food production which is something that is quite vital and quite widely practiced across the rural urban continuum. So I want to reflect today on how urban agriculture flourishes in many cities despite the fact that uh, sometimes there is a lack of adequate governance frameworks. So but let's start by uh, saying some words about urban agriculture. Um urban and peri urban food production is widely practiced in cities around the world. I bring you two examples today. On the right hand side you see an urban farming group in Nairobi, Kenya where urban agriculture has been reported to thrive thrive during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. 
And on the left-hand side, you have an allotment garden in Dresden, Germany. And this is actually a picture that was taken from my window. So that's, uh, we live next to uh, allotment gardens. And these are pretty much part of the German culture. So every city that you visit in Germany, you are likely to find some of these spaces in and around the city, which actual purpose is, or the primary purpose is food production. So there are many reasons why people would want to practice urban agriculture. But regardless of that, uh, of those um, reasons, the fact is that while doing urban agriculture, people are actually also contributing to addressing some of the key challenges of urbanization. So for instance, if we talk from a social perspective, Urban farming provides recreational opportunities such as physical exercise, but just, just uh, the opportunity for disconnection from the stressful daily life in cities. But it is also set to increase social cohesion. At the same time, urban agriculture can be uh, an important source of food and also an alternative source of livelihood, which is especially important in countries of the global south. Moreover, it has been reported that urban agriculture favors social inclusion and empowerment, especially for women. And besides all these social aspects that are positive to urban agriculture, there are also a bunch of biodiversity and ecosystem services that also benefit our cities. For instance, um, one of the main characteristics of urban agricultural areas is their capacity to, re to regulate local climate. So temperature regulation is really important in cities, for instance, to avoid the heat island effect. It, al it also contributes to reducing the water runoff and increases infiltration of water, uh, therefore also preventing uh, or contributing to prevent floodings and stormwater runoff which at the same time reduces the resilience of the city towards climate-related uh, risk. So there are a lot of proven benefits to urban agriculture. And what I want to explore with you today is actually how governance factors frame the implementation of nature-based solutions, urban agriculture being the example here, and how this framing holds the potential to support or hinder the capacity of urban agriculture to address key societal challenges of urbanization. And I want to explore this via a case study. It's not a case study about successful uh, implementation of urban agriculture, but it's more a case study that highlights what are the challenges regarding these governance uh, factors that can arise while trying to, uh, to implement urban agriculture. And the case study I'm talking about is the one of the city of Tamale in Ghana. This is a case study that has been widely covered and is also the focus of one of the recent publications of Planet Up that I were, I'm a co-author. I would be happy to share that on the chat with you after my um, presentation. So the city of Tamale is the capital of the Northern region in Ghana, and it's considered a medium-sized city of about 0.4 million inhabitants. And it is also perceived as a rapidly development, uh, developing city with a lot of businesses going on and infrastructural projects. But at the same time, the city of Ghana has less than 47% of its population classified as food secure. So no wonder that given this high uh, food insecurity, urban agriculture is an activity that is also widely practiced in and around the city. So about 40% of the population in Tamale practice urban agriculture. And this is an activity that is especially important for women that find a close to home alternative for generating some additional income and production of food, while at the same time being able to cover some of their dairy activities at home. And in the city of Tamale, urban agriculture is practiced in vacant housing plots, backyards, and close to water sources. 
But the thing is that most of these locations are not land secure. So that means that agricultural plots are constantly under threat of invasion by commercial and residential users, or in the case of public land, under eviction threats from the management of the public institutions whose land the urban farmers occupy. So this is interesting because on the one hand, you have this really high percentage of the population doing agriculture in the city of Tamale. But at the same time, there seems not to be an easy way to access land for urban agriculture uh, in a formal way. So exploring, I want to explore more or less the complications of this framework for this specific city. And just as a basic uh, background information, in Ghana, there are two uh, tenure regimes that coexist. One is the formal and tenure regulation that is given by the government, and the other one is the customary tenure arrangement in which local chiefs are seen as the custodians of land and are the ones that allocate land to citizens. And that is actually a system that is also common to other uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And about 80% of the country's land is under customary ownership. So if you would be a citizen in, in Tamale and you would want to access some land for agriculture, then your first take would be to go to one of the local chiefs and ask for um, a piece of land. So that would be actually the path number one. Let's go and request land from customary chiefs in exchange for a token or a gift. But in recent times, these tokens or gifts that were traditionally given to the chiefs have been replaced by money. And what happens when you monetize an activity? Quite quickly, this activity uh, obeys the laws of the capitalism. And that is that normally um, land allocation to farming is marginalized in favor to other more profitable interests. In fact, in the city of uh, Tamale, chiefs have been, there has been allegations of chiefs, chiefs allocating money to the highest bidder. The second path for uh, accessing land would be to ask the local authorities, the metropolitan authorities. And actually, urban agriculture is a legal form of land use according to the Ghanaian Land Use and Spatial Planning Act that authorizes urban farming activities, provided that the local authorities issue a permit. But what happens in practice in Tamale, like in many other cities, is that the city of Tamale does not have designated agricultural areas. That means it is not recognized as a land, valid land use within the zoning of the city. And nor the, there is a local policy in place for enhancing uh, these permits. And as such, currently there are not agricultural permit, permits granted by the authorities of the city of Tamale. So some of the outcomes of these, and just let me say that I'm just addressing the issue of land use and not topping, touching upon other complexities like the, the, the water governance that was touched upon by uh, my colleague Anna. Um, but at the end of the day, this uh, governance framework keeps urban agriculture outside formality. And outside formality is still well accepted and common. So it is widely practiced still because it obeys a demand, a demand for food for alternative income sources. So it is still existent, but it still exists in areas that are not land secure. So at the end of the day, the legal framework does not benefit agricultural producers whose interests are undermined by more powerful stakeholders. And some general remarks linking this topic to the overall session is that governance factors can compromise the ability of urban agriculture to contribute to building resilience in cities. So we started by saying all these benefits that urban agriculture as a nature-based solution could provide to cities. But we see that in practice, this is hindered by many factors. In this case, the ones that I highlighted uh, have to do with weak legal framework. And these factors often emerge from the complex interactions between urban development planning, formal and informal land tenure arrangements, and food security. 
So even though urban agriculture is widely recognized as important in terms of uh, food generation for cities and in addressing complex societal challenges in the global south, still in many countries it, and cities, it faces challenges to develop, to maintain, or even to formalize. As I already mentioned, this is part of one of the recent uh, policy and practice reviews made by Plan Adapt. And I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, yeah. Next, we have uh, Dr. Anjali Carol Mohan. She is an urban and regional planner, and her broad areas of practice and research include development, urbanization, and urban management and policy. She is also recently involved in action research, where she looks at the intersection of climate change and urbanization induced vulnerabilities in the global south. And she also works on evolving bottom up planning frameworks that foreground informality and voices, lived experiences, and traditional knowledge towards building resilient cities. Uh, Anjali? Yeah, thanks, uh, Gayatri. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so yes, in many ways, my my presentation today is going to uh, echo a lot of conversations that have already occurred, a lot of thoughts that have already been put forward. I'm going to start with a, a study that we have researched that we have been uh, doing for a while uh, in this in the city of Ranchi in India, which is actually a tribal city. But when we started looking at this uh, uh, research, we had positioned it as trying to understand how ec ecosystem services can be leveraged to provision the contemporary city, and in the process, how can we, uh, you know, address the issues of urban poverty as well as enhance the resilience of the cities. And this was in a context where cities are becoming largely exclusionary on one hand and are at the receiving end of climate change uh, induced vulnerabilities, which are intersecting with very uh, rapid and very uh, an unprecedented urbanization. And that itself is like a double-edged sword. One where the impacts of the manifestations are disproportionately distributed in the cities of the global south. The poor are definitely disproportionately impacted. So I'm going to just run quickly through this presentation to explain what we have done and to look at what other possibilities. Uh, when we started looking at the city of uh, Ranchi, and I would like to say here that Ranchi is by no means an isolated case. This is a story and we have seen it also within this session, which most of the cities in the global south face. Uh, cities in the southern city is not really a planned or a designed city. And that's something that we really need to understand. It's a city that has evolved over millennia. And what we started to argue as we started to trace the evolution of the city of Ranchi was that this, this evolution uh, over centuries in itself has, uh, has a lot to offer to the contemporary city and especially to uh, planning and developing uh, cities. So this is the uh, tribal city of Ranchi, which actually is um, today is also continues to be a city which is sitting on uh, tribal hamlets, which are clustered together. But as the city grew and as the city expanded, as you can see on the final image on the right hand side, most of the tribal, tribal uh, settlements have got subsumed within the larger city fabric, which is more or less an urban sprawl, which has eaten into the surrounding um, a region which was largely an, uh, a forested area. And as it has uh, subsumed these tribal uh, hamlets within the formal planning registers and governance registers, these are today marked as informal settlements. So we tried to understand how the voices of this informality can be put uh, foregrounded in planning scripts that emanate from and are anchored in the ground reality of these informal settlements. Uh, essentially, as has been already said, in uh, what we also uh, say is that as the city expands, what we are also arguing is that as the city expands, the dominant planning tool in most of the cities of the global south, which is really a uh, 
is it's a it has been incepted through colonization and imperialism but it and it continues in many of the cities this is mismatched to the ground realities essentially because of uh, one it operates at a level which is very far from the ground and uh, in its quest for modernization uh, it has it it fails to connect with the ground and always considers the ground as the um, as a counter to the modernization narrative. So what essentially the exclusionary city that you see uh, today, the contemporary 21st century uh, city of the global south is largely a state orchestrated uh, inclusionary city. And therefore the question, how do we create inclusive and resilient cities? And this is an emerging, emerging imperative, which needs to be addressed on a priority. Now, uh, just go back a little bit. What is really exacerbating this exclusion and the multidimensional poverty that we see in many of these cities is the climate change induced uh, vulnerabilities, which I've already spoken about. So we started to look at the city of Ranchi, Yako. Uh, and one of the things that we started to look was that how had the city evolved? What were the uh, you know this uh, human habitations, how they were at one, how they were once upon a time, to what they are today. And in this in this particular image, you will see that we have mapped a few hamlets that are today actually informal settlements, uh, classified as informal settlements in the city. These were all located alongside the river, and there was a certain pattern around the way the land was occupied. It was the higher areas or the um, highlands in the uh, were largely dedicated to uh, housing, where the lowlands, which were more fertile grounds, was where agriculture was practiced. The cities had their own, or the, sorry, the hamlets had their own open spaces, which were really about collective living and community uh, living. And uh, they were in many ways self-sufficient. There was a decentralized uh, way of living and managing. Water was drawn from sources like the wells. They were uh, more uh, localized uh, structures called, in this case, they are referred to as dadis, but these are essentially ponds in the floodplain of the river. Uh, food was sourced locally and livelihoods were largely embedded within this. Uh, um, within the settlement itself, right? But what did get the settlements together or what brought in different settlements together was, for example, the markets, which were weekly markets, which were, um, and where communities congregated and there was a lot of social exchange that would happen. But as we move on and we um, see what has happened to these settlements, especially in a city like Ranchi, uh, and this is, again, I'm saying we have this whole idea of concept of urban villages, which has found a mention in formal planning processes. And therefore, and this is very common in most of the Southeast Asian countries, in India included. So by from that perspective, Ranchi is by no means an isolated case, as I said. But as we moved on, we started to map what exactly has happened. And we see that the master planning approach, which is largely a top-down approach, has very little consideration for, say, the lay of the land, the way land is occupied, uh, the public spaces that these settlements hold, their connection to the larger ecology, how they have been uh, provisioning from the um, how the ecology has been provisioning this uh, human habitation and how the human habitation in return is stewarding the larger environment. Instead, what you find is that larger infrastructure, as is the um, approach of, a, of the top-down planning processes, seems to cut across land without any consideration. It ends up fragmenting these uh, hamlets and these landscapes. And in the process, what has happened is that not only have the, has the reliance on the ecosystem services reduced, but there is a, it has created a vulnerability in which the, low, the, the community or the individual has very little say or has very little uh, ammunition to deal with that uh, vulnerability. Uh, so we found in our study that you know there was a lot that had got fragmented, had got obliterated, but a lot continued to exist. Now, when we say it continued to exist, what we find is that uh, while you know the as the densities increased, as the 
number of people into moving into the cities increased the urbanized the unprecedented urbanization attracted uh, more and more people who were occupying occupying land in a very unscientific manner but for instance the smaller public spaces continue to exist uh, more importantly what we find is that the traditional knowledge systems the local knowledge the bottom up uh, perspective the worms eye view as well as the lived everyday experiences continue to exist and these are actually sources of wisdom sources of knowledge which can really uh, inform the contemporary uh, city and the city planning in effect this can allow us to create planning scripts which are anchored in the lived reality or the, uh, grounded in the communities and their needs and aspirations yeah so very quickly this is just to show uh, how we actually did it, we were looking at these uh, settlements and we used oral histories, focus group discussions, uh, we, look, we walked the settlements, we mapped the settlements and we participant observation, these were some of the methods. But what came out very strongly in these, or especially the oral histories was the lived experiences and the traditional wisdom as to how land was occupied, how it should be looked after and what what are some of the changes that have has been brought in the fragmentation? And also in some cases, we understood how this could be repaired or restored. Uh, if we move on, so this is again, some of the quotes that we got from the oral histories where people are very aware of what is really happening in the larger city, but they're extremely helpless in terms of having any sort of a, a recourse or a, uh, say in how these fragmentations can be repaired, repaired or even countered. Uh, yeah, if you move on. So just to say, I mean, in, in many ways, it's not to romanticize what we are seeing or what was uh, what we are seeing as poverty today, but is actually to go deeper and understand what are some of the knowledge systems that existed and how these can be utilized, for instance, to provision the contemporary city. So here I've just picked up one of them. For example, this was the lay of the land and it was, this is your river and the land is sloping this way. So essentially your entire habitation was what you see on the left-hand side, which is the highland or referred to as the Thunder area. And as, you, as it slopes towards the river, you realize the different types, depending on the soil, the amount of water available, the, um, the depth of the uh, area, uh, we, or there are different types of um, crops that were grown, which were provisioning these settlements. But as we move to this uh, very top-down planning framework, there is absolutely no space for this sort of knowledge. And this was largely by design because engaging with the ground was one, not in favor of the modernization project of the state, but also in terms of, you know, it is extremely difficult. It's just so complex, it's diverse. And if you're only keeping an eye at the, the at using a bird's eye view, it's very difficult to engage with the ground. And it's also got to do very much with the command and control approach of the state as was discussed earlier in this session. So you see that land has continuously got in, uh, um, irrespective of its topography, irrespective of its, uh, uh, you know, its productivity, its capability, land keeps, is getting concretized. And this is what is leading to increasing floods or droughts as we see it today. So this was what we kind of, uh, you know, looked at, for instance, in Ranchi, and we thought this was a knowledge that could be taken up into planning, into, can be instituted into planning scripts. But what we also realized in the process was that a lot of these, in the informal settlements, there are these community commons or shared cultural space, community spaces, which are becoming very, very, uh, what would you say, critical to adapt to climate change as it is impacting the everyday uh, living. And there is a potential of locally led adaptation which can be animated with little or no, no effort. So we started, this is from some of our other studies that we have been engaged in. Uh, so here we started, yeah, can you move on? Yeah, we started to look at some of the shared community spaces across cities in, uh, in India. And what you see to the left-hand side is another informal settlement in a tier two city in the state of Karnataka, which is a traditional hamlet again. Uh, and you see that the, uh, 
you know, the, the, the kind of shared community spaces while very, very small and um, perhaps very insignificant to, from a bird's eye view are in effect used in a very different way by the, by the community as a whole, but also by the individual households uh, who are abutting that space. So over here, you can see that there is this uh, tree with a, with a shrine and there is a platform over here and there is a myriad activities that happen um, in this space through the day. To the right hand side, we see how the road itself becomes an extension of the house and how this, the road uh, that is, uh, in the informal settlement, it becomes a more public space where people are spilling over, not just for uh, social functions, but it's also how they do their e everyday activities. Yeah. So similarly, a case in uh, Bangalore where we see that there is this washer uh, washing, uh, what is called the dhobis or the washer washermen in um, uh, in the city of Bangalore, their entire community lives in a particular settlement. And this is also a traditional community. As the city has engulfed it, it's become a slum because it has not been provisioned. But you do see that a lot of common spaces are being used as uh, to facilitate the livelihoods in these uh, um, settlements. Uh, now, these, this is another image of another street which becomes very dynamic. It is a multifunctional space, uh, space where people are socializing, people are cooking, their livelihoods uh, are very much uh, embedded or are connected to this street. And the point that we, the, uh, one of the insights we had was that how these community commons are really extension spaces of everyday living, whether it is at the individual or at the household scale. So moving ahead, we also realized that, you know, these are also spaces that are uh, facing multiple risks. So here, what we have is a, a puffed rice community in another city where, you know, there is a landfill site and then there are these puffed rice units uh, that are located and then there is an abutting lake through which water is sourced and all kinds of other uh, dependencies are there. But what we see is that there is a lot of um, climate change induced uh, vulnerabilities uh, that can impact the working or the livelihoods of these people who are using the space to dry the rice, to uh, sort out various things and all kinds of activities happen in the space. But then as it rains, for instance, there is, there, uh, uh, there is a lot of water from the landfill sites that starts to impact this area. There is, of course, toxic fuel, fumes and for, uh, odor that is um, impacting and this then tends to impact the livelihoods of the people so just trying to look at this what we were trying to what we tried to then over here conceptualize it as is as a, pot a potential adaptive adaptive space which could be for instance through very small non-engineering solutions could be made to function as a space which is uh, in a way providing respite from all the uh, vulnerabilities. So this could be done through, for instance, um, you know, putting in some vegetation, putting in some trenches, allowing water to filter the, uh, in a natural way and creating spaces that then are much more shaded and allow for a better um, functioning through the day for people who use these spaces for their livelihoods. Uh, so yeah, uh, what does this tell us just to kind of uh, some of my presentation is that yes, there is this call for reforming formal planning pro uh, processes, and what we argue is that it's important, at least in the in the, in the context of the southern city, to start looking at land as an ecological resource. Right now, it is constantly being looked upon as an economic resource, which has to be capitalized and commercialized uh, to the extent possible. Um, so land has to be conceived as an ecological resource and to do so if we start to institute a worm's eye view and start to inform that or embed within that worm's eye view the socio-cultural complexities that do exist on the ground then yes there is all this should find uh, some mention in our planning scripts which are anchored in the uh, I anchored uh, within the 
diversity and the plurality of the southern city. And what we are arguing is that acknowledging the embedded knowledge systems, foregrounding uh, the lived experiences, and integrating these within the larger top-down frameworks is a way forward. So I kind of leave it here and um, uh, I'm open to questions, clarifications uh, as we move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amri, and uh, all the speakers. Uh, what we'll do right now is that we'll take a very short bio break and we'll come back in uh, two minutes. And following that, we'll uh, go ahead with the discussion on the emerging questions and provocations that has come up uh, as part of all the presentations. Yes, so thank you very much. So uh, I think two, uh, yeah, two to three minutes is what yes. we can. Yes. In the meanwhile, the provocations will remain on the screen. So those of you who want to come up with more questions and provocations can continue to do so.
Anjali, should I respond to this question? Uh, sure. Chat box? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Please go ahead, Dr. Vasu. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Amit. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I was trying to say that uh, given the pressures of just making a, making out a living, making a basic livelihood, and now, of course, catering to the new kind of aspirations most uh, people have, uh, there is very little thought given to the strategies that are required to make their own, uh, you know, surroundings and the livelihoods, uh, you know, uh, resilient. Uh, for example, which I mentioned, uh, you know, the way in which soil is being abused, uh, despite information that, uh, you know, there's severe degradation of soil that the water table has, you know, has been lowered down, etc. There are no attempts to either conserve or restore store soil or conserve water at all. Uh, what we see is really a hasty way of uh, making quick profits either from the land or, or from other sources. Uh, one is also, I think, uh, the, the, none of these uh, strategies are promoted in a, any significant way. Uh, for example, all the chemicalization of agriculture or the intense ways in which uh, big extractive technologies are being deployed, they are being actually being subsidized by the government. Uh, whereas alternative, more sustainable practices are not being promoted at all. So I think it, it, it's a combination of both. Uh, the lack of macro uh, you know, uh, support and then the micro responses to this lack of support. Yeah. Thank you, Vasmi. If, if I can just order the questions, uh, there is one question for... Uh, Mariana from Anjali. Mariana, would you be able to take that? I can read it out for you. How can yes, urban please. agriculture? <laughs> how can urban agriculture be incentivized in cities? We do see that in cities in India, there is a lot of urban agriculture, but it is being lost out in favor of other sources of income, such as rental income. Over to you, Mariana. Thank you for the question. It's an interesting one, actually. And I, I don't believe there is a single uh, answer to that one. Uh, I, I would love to hear the ideas of the rest about that. I can only mention some of the barriers, for instance, that there is this lack of capacity of local governments for establishing and enhancing their own regulations. Uh, on the top of that, corruption is also an issue there um, in which land is allocated to the highest bidder. Um, another element is the lack of zoning that includes land, uh, land for agriculture as a valid land use within the cities. Um, and then the prevalence of more powerful commercial interest um, above the the necessity of, of the wider society, because we are talking that urban agriculture provides not only food and income alternatives for the more marginalized ones, but in the long run, it also provides benefits to the city as a whole. So uh, again, here, I think one of the key issues lies in how to empower local grassroots organizations to actually uh, give a voice to this need and give a voice to the benefits uh, and the needs of establishing urban agriculture in the cities. Also agricultural associations and also not to for forget NGOs that also represent social uh, civil society and could also contribute largely to progressing an agenda within cities that visibilizes the importance of urban agriculture. I hope that helps. <laughs> yes, thank you. As I have written there also, just to add, you know, the trade-offs, I think what is very complicated is that the trade-off is really between very uh, hard, work, hard work that agriculture demands, and at least in our context, low returns, to relatively less work and high returns, say through the example I gave, which is of rental income, which we've been seeing in many cities. So, yes, and I think there's an... I added important dimension that Mariana actually made in her presentation, which is 
uh, <clears throat> ironical as it seems, agriculture is not seen as a recognized land use. Uh, you're giving the example of Tamala, I'm sure it is the case with many, many other cities. So there is a constant struggle to even recognize it as a valid land use within the so-called urbanized space. Okay, so there are two questions here, more as thoughts and comments from uh, Soumya and Para, pa Paras, and I'm going to combine them because they, I, they tend to address the same issue. Uh, one is from Soumya, which looks at the land as an ecological resource and how do we actually make it viable for re revenue generation. And that is partly answered by the previous uh, comment by Mariana. But related to this is an important point, which Paras raises about the village development plans or the participation of these villages whose farmlands are being taken up for the needs of the expanding city. Uh, since these are the original landowners, what kind of rights and opportunities we, can they assure for themselves in exchange for their land that will be surrendered to urbanization? Uh, I invite all the speakers one by one. Uh, we can start in the same order to respond because I think these comments actually bring together uh, many of the discussions that has happened across the scales and geographies. Uh, Dr. Vasvi, can I invite you first? Yeah. Yeah, if you can respond to uh, the provocation about the ecological resource of the land and its viability for revenue generation and the landowners' rights in exchange for urbanization of their land in terms of their livelihood and activities. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what exactly I should do. Should I just elaborate on that? Or yeah, you can, you can expand that? on the point. You can, yes, or yeah. qualify or respond. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. A, a concern has been that, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, at least three decades of data and very good research show that the a green revolution model or the what is called the uh, industrial uh, chemical agricultural complex has been devastating both ecologically and in some ways even economically and uh, productivity is only a short term uh, gain. Uh, so in that context uh, where climate change is now flagging the importance of decentralized agroclimatic zone based agricultures, not just one agriculture, but many types of agricultures. How should those knowledge systems and complementary knowledge systems, not only about cultivating, but processing food, grains, conserving grains, uh, conserving natural resources, soil, water, seeds, biodiversity, etc. How can those be codified and made legitimate? How can they become formal part of the formal, uh, you know, agroecological knowledge systems uh, rather than the what is now are being taught in most universities or institutions. Uh, so that was uh, where I was coming from. Okay. Uh, Aina, can I invite you to respond? Um, I think, can you pass me on this one? I, I'm struggling to make the connection between what I was talking okay. about and this one. So I'm sure other people will have much better inputs than I do. Sure, we can, we can come back to you when you're ready. Uh, Sudhira, any thoughts on this, especially in its intersection on urbanization and what you very uh, rightly mentioned about <clears throat> the bureaucratic entrepreneurship? I think that's an important point here. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, again, uh, at some level, it all also boils down to the nature of economic planning, right? As in, I don't think we have been really looking at economic planning, so to say. I, I remember having a conversation with uh, uh, Professor Vasvi several years ago, as in uh, end, of a, end of the day, all of us are becoming consumers in the sense of different products or, or goods and services at the local level. And bulk of what you're generating as an economy is driven down elsewhere. And in the larger scheme of things on, and like we're looking at climate change and all, right? So now, uh, Nowhere are we conscious, consciously looking at how do we go about integrating economic activity with our regional planning. 
Now, uh, again, bringing the context of urban agriculture and all, uh, I see that uh, uh, like I, I'm, I'm clearly disturbed with, with the insertion of the attribute of uh, non-agriculture population in cities. In the sense, uh, so it's kind of, uh, it's, it's sort of, a, so, you know, starting as a no starter, a non-starter, at, 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 like, uh, you know, at large. That is one. And I guess, I guess uh, like I said, I guess, I think it's, it's important to see how we now have to re -look, really relook at economic bringing and economic planning as such into the larger scheme of things, making it more regional or more local than, uh, you know, being mere consumers of goods and services and that that has different consequences at large yeah thank you <clears throat> if, if i can merely add to uh Soumya's thoughts here where one wants to look at the idea of land as an ecological resource i think one needs to expand on what sudira was mentioning where at the moment land is merely seen as an economic resource at best real estate and its valuation is done accordingly. But unless we actually tie up its ecological potential with livelihood, and in this case, its potential for addressing climate change in so many dimensions that the way the speakers have elaborated, that would be the game changer where one can actually look at the natural capacity of land rather than merely looking at it as an economic resource. Uh, please continue to share your thoughts in the chat box if we are not able to address all of them effectively. I'm sure it will add to the conversation. We should be able to get back to you at some time. Can I just come in uh, in response to this particular, these two questions raised by Soumya and Paras? Yeah, please. Uh, so one, just to kind of give also a very direct uh, response, you know, that uh, uh, there is what we see in the cities is uh, really uh, the real, the cities of today are the actual real estate uh, projects. So we, as Mohan said, we need to move a little bit away from that. And within plan and policy, we need to start foregrounding the ecological uh, gains that uh, can be uh, brought in. And unfortunately, we are always looking at it through the economic lens. Even the environment, we start to look at it through the economic lens. So in one way, I think uh, that ecological lens has to find a, a place within plan and policy where we are actually able to quantify in some way the gains that the, you, one can make by looking at land as an ecological resource. That's the first. But in a very everyday um, you know, matter of fact way, I think what needs to be done is to actually start to cap some of the, uh, one is the land prices, but also the built fabric in some way, because once the city, one, in most of our cities, we are just expanding uh, vertically and the gains from that vertical expansion are so high that, uh, you know, and and that it's a it's a it's a cause and effect because land is a very valuable resource. People want to monetize it because they are able to monetize it so easily, even through uh, what should I say violations, that it becomes a very important economic resource. So I think these are some of the things that need to be um, discussed before we do anything else. But these conversations need to come out in the open for us to then start to address some of these issues in terms of the village development plans. Again, I have no answer and the answers to these are not very simple, but I think uh, the, uh, the answer largely again uh, lies in how do you start to value the agricultural land, the farmland around cities, how do you start to break, or within cities, how do you start to break this binary of the urban and the rural, which is largely also positioned as the modern and the traditional, and the modern is always good over the traditional, and these are some of the narratives which are driving urbanization. So I think some of these actually need to be broken down. How we do it, it's really, again, gain, ensuring that these conversations gain momentum uh, within policy and plan. Thanks, Anjali. There is an earlier question, which I'm sorry I missed out from uh, Deeksha Subhash. Uh, it's specifically uh, for or Anna, but I will invite Sudhira or Anjali also to contribute. The question is, could you please elaborate on various regulatory tools that would facilitate 
encouraging or adopting a bottom up approach instead of a command and control approach when it comes to water resource management in urban settings anna thank you yeah i'm just thinking of the question i mean i'm not sure they necessarily regulatory tools that would be the starting point for that um other than to rethink maybe, but in the case of South Africa, we have very progressive legislation around participatory democracy and participatory resource management. So in, in, in many instances, it's not really a regulatory change that's required. It is more of an... Um, a relational and operational change in how those regulations are exercised. Um, and that's why I do think, you know, my provocation around rethinking the role, um, the role of democratically elected leadership at the local scale mm -hmm. in urban contexts, for me, is an increasingly interesting place to start. I mean, we're seeing a fair amount of civic organization. So outside of the formal government regulated forums, um, you know, we're seeing increasing mobilization. Uh, I very briefly referred on my last slide to something in the Cape Town context, for example, called the Water Caucus, which is a civic organization that is, um, you know, getting people together around concerns of water service delivery and deteriorating water quality and lack of access around water in, in our, uh, our urban settlements um, and trying to mobilize in order to... Um, facilitate a more constructive conversation with city government around how some of those problems can be addressed. And so even though we have very progressive legislation around how local government, uh, the, the kinds of participatory processes that local governments need to go through from a planning and resource management perspective, they, they're not working. They're not be, people's experience of trying to go into constructive engagements with local government around um, concerns about, as I say, water quality or water service delivery or access to groundwater abstraction or whatever, is, is experienced as very alienating and is mostly very atomized. You know, the city puts out uh, proposed plans and policies that are open for comment, but usually they're in a format that are completely inaccessible to um, but both a format and a, a language and a, and a logic that's inaccessible to most individuals in any city. And then, you know, when it comes to citizens um, raising grievances with the city, it's, it's very individualized. You log a service complaint or query with the city and it gets treated on a one-by-one -one basis. So we don't have sort of um, political mobilization around what are actually mass collective experiences of, um, of failure of the state to deliver um, public services that, that are needed to support um, urban livelihoods and, and households and, and support healthy living and well-being. Um, and so I think it is, yeah, so, so I think the main thing is that it's partly about shifting um, the, na the nature of the relationship and the level of mistrust and, and miscommunication between local government and, and businesses as, and residents in our city to be able to take a more holistic and kind of constructively um, sustainable approach to resource use than this very kind of 
capitalist, economic, individualized, you know, very much within the sort of new public management paradigm mm -hmm. of people as consumers and customers of government. And that relationship is just not working. It's, it's absolutely uh, deteriorating the sustainability of our cities. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And I think it actually foregrounds one idea that has been running through all the speakers' presentations at different levels, where the idea of a ground up or a bottom up or a grassroots does not necessarily mean a civic engagement or a personal engagement by citizens, but it definitely has to include the locally elected elected representatives, which has been largely missing in many of the conversations, especially in the presentation that Sudhira made about how the bureaucratic entrepreneurship has taken over the roles of the elected representatives. Thank you. Sudhira, would you like to add to that point? Uh, well, uh, yes, I guess uh, that's really the point. As in, uh, the larger thing is how do we now mobilize us in uh, uh, one? Uh, clearly, like I like I, like I wish I had like one of us had a magic wand to you know just <laughs> grab, <laughs> put it across and change things. But the way things are emerging is is really uh, a concern, like. Uh, what Anna said now, right? As in, because of the way uh, uh, the state has implemented uh, the new public management and corporatized services, uh, the citizen has been transformed into consumer. And and now, how do we now get back the citizen? As in, uh, so that they participate, ask questions, plan for things, and go ahead. As I guess that's that's the really. Uh, uh, the key challenge then, how do we go about it? It's, it's, it's ironical that the ones who were seen as the powerful, the elected representatives are the least powerful in, in this whole process as yes. we see it today. Yes, yes. yes and I think in, in our case, we also need to, uh, yes, the whole, well, on, on one hand, we, there is this, very loud pitch for participatory planning again. How do we bring in communities? But we also have to keep in mind that uh, one is the community's ability and will to participate. And second is the complexity around the whole thing, primarily because especially in the Indian case, the, the numbers are so hard, large. So I think we need to find a way to do it. I'm not saying it's impossible. I, I, I champion for the idea of participatory planning of policy making but i think we still haven't cracked as to how this can be done and how does one go about it the whole model around it that is something that is uh, still continues to be a challenge yes and then this is a recurring theme as i can see uh, by rajesh who has posted several thoughts they're not really questions so unfortunately they did not come up but but the idea about the state and non-state players and the, the kind of triggers that urban areas uh, have the need to expand ties in a lot of these conversations together. So thanks for your very, very insightful comments, Rajesh. There is one more question I can see from uh, Joel. Oh, it's just coming now. Yeah, yes. yeah. Would you like to read that out? Yes. Uh, Joel's question is the discussion around water services and water resource management is challenging across scales and contexts. Uh, interested to hear your thoughts about transboundary resource management, specifically water, where the natural systems cross government slash jurisdiction boundaries and the impact of these arrangements on local communities. I will invite actually, everyone has spoken about this at various different scales, uh, though it was specifically present in Anna's uh, discussion on the Nelson Bay Municipality. So Anna, would you like to take this up? 
Thank you. And maybe to relate this to, to um, the point Anjali just made about the model for participatory planning and management. For me, the key on this are intermediaries who, you know, that, that we recognize all of these issues are transboundary at some scale, right? Not, you know, some are between communities, between municipalities, between regions, between countries. Um, and so we know that we need more coordinated and collaborative modalities for arriving at decisions and interventions, you know, instruments for intervening in the problem. Um, and for me, it becomes a question of intermediaries and the function of intermediating that, of course, different actors, whether it's across sectors, public, private, or different jurisdictions, have a different stake in, in that deliberation and that decision and that intervention and stand to, to kind of win or lose differently. And so part of the model that we're looking for in participatory kind of cross-scalar participatory governance and planning are, are the, in increasing the capacity and the, the people, the organizations who can play that intermediation role in a way that's kind of considered to be trusted by the different parties. And I, I increasingly am intrigued by what the future role of the university is in that. Uh, maybe being somebody based at a university and very much picking up on um, Anjali's point about the, you know, the complexity of these problems is challenging for, you know, no, no, none of the stakeholders, no matter where they're positioned, including researchers, can have a, a full understanding of the, you know, the, the complexity of, of the, the system and, and how, what the feedbacks will be of various interventions. So it's, it is very much about governing and planning for emergence. It's not, that's the difference between the command and control approach is we don't know all of the causal relationships and effects. So we can't predict and intervene. We have to you know, sense, probe, try, experiment, and change as we go. And so I think there's a growing role for which we don't have many, many playing that role yet of intermediation. And I wonder whether traditional knowledge actors can play more of that role. In, in the Cape Town case, we have interesting actors emerging. We have something called Green Cape, which is an organization that has been established within the last 10 years to act as an intermediary between our provincial government, our municipalities, and our business community. And then we have another organization that's been set up in a similar time period called the Economic Development Partnership, which is mediates between provincial government, municipal, sort of neighboring municipalities, and the civic organizations. And so I think there's a growing role for, for investing in the capacity that those intermediary organizations can, can play um, in, what, in whatever the model shapes up to be. Yeah, uh, that, thanks, Anna. I, this discussion has been so interesting, I've completely lost track of time and we are one minute away from closing. Uh, however, I would urge you to continue to contribute to the whiteboard and uh, Anushree, if you want to share that link again in the chat for some people who have joined late, I invite you to continue to keep the conversation going on the Miro uh, whiteboard that we can see on the screen now. And uh, thank you everyone for keeping this conversation so alive. Uh, An Anjali, I hand it back to you. Thank you very much. I think it was a good session and we had good participation. Thanks to everybody for uh, giving their time, uh, both as presenters as well as uh, for those who have been uh, part of these conversations. 
uh, we will keep in touch. The idea is to, uh, you know, collate some of these uh, discussions and to see what we can cull out of it, which can feed into the COP27. And uh, we will keep all that. Uh, we will keep you informed about all that. And yes, uh, special thanks to all the panelists who agreed to give their time and share their knowledge. Thank you very much. Just a last word. I think the questions continue to get more and more interesting just as we are yeah, finishing the deadline. We will collate these and share it with the panelists and hopefully some of this will get populated on the whiteboard. Thank you, everyone.